Well, if you want to see me challenged to act like a pastor, if you want to see me really struggle to act like a pastor, say something hateful about my wife and my kids or say something hateful to my wife and my kids. You can say whatever you want to me and it really doesn't faze me. You can talk about me and it really doesn't bother me. But oh my goodness, if you say something about my wife or my kids that's hateful or you say something hateful to them, my sanctification gets challenged a little bit because I want to respond because I love them. And if I'm not ready for, yeah, we are on this together. And if I'm not ready for that and I'm not where I need to be, I'll say something that I'm going to regret later. I know, I, I've seen me do it. <laughs> my, my reaction comes out of my great love for them and I want to protect them. I used to joke that when I would have a, a sit down with my girls' boyfriends when the first time they'd take them out in high school, that I would say, if they didn't treat my daughter the way she needed to be treated, I was coming after them. And I'm not afraid to go back to prison. I, I never actually said that to, to any of them. And I've never actually been in prison. But it, there's some truth to it, too. Because when my girls would date somebody, they had to come into the house and sit down with me. And they were uncomfortable because I was pretty clear about how I cared about my daughters. And I expected them to treat my daughters the way uh, I would expect that they would. And I, I think about my daughter Cameron, her now husband, um, when he came in for the first time, uh, we were having this talk, and I could tell how nervous he was. His hands were shaking, and his voice would quake as I, we talked about how to treat my daughter. And it didn't help him, really, that our families already knew one another. So before he came over, he told his dad, he said, I'm a little nervous about me, you know, sitting down with Mr. Reimer. And he's like, you probably should be. So it didn't really set the, the tone for it to be relaxing. I, I love my wife and my kids passionately, and I can't imagine how I'd respond if somebody did something truly horrible to one of them. Have you heard of a guy named Gary Ridgway? Who's heard of Gary Ridgway? He's, no, not many people. I didn't know until this sermon, but he is known as the Green River Killer. He is the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history. He killed at least 49 young women and buried their bodies along the banks of the Green River. That's why he's called the Green River Killer. I want to show you a picture of some of his victims. Some of the investigators in that case think that he killed actually quite a few more women than that, but those are the ones they could prove. There's actually video of different parts of his trial, and so you can go on YouTube and, and watch some of that if you, if you want to. I, I wouldn't do it except I was getting ready for this sermon. But he was convicted on all 49 counts that he was charged with, and before sentencing, his attorneys cut a plea deal with the state where to avoid the death penalty, he agreed to tell all the families where the bodies were buried along the Green River which was a big deal for those families. But part of the deal was also that they got to be in a room and to look him in the eye and tell them, tell this killer what he had done to their family. These are called victim's impact speeches and the, the criminal has to sit through that and when the family tells them what you took from us. And as you might imagine, some of these were hate-filled. Some of these I can't even tell because they were uh, we're in church, so I can't use the words they used. And I just want to give you just a couple of statements from, uh, just little quick ones from a couple of those families. Here's a quick statement. I hope you go to hell because that's where you belong. Another angrily said this, I hope you suffer and you experience a slow, agonizing, painful death. And then there were some that were sad. One family said this, who let you decide to be God? that you get to decide life and death for our child. And, and as I think about those families, and I resonate on what they must have experienced, I sympathize with them, and I start to feel the exact same way and go, yeah, you go. But when those were happening, Gary Ridgway stared there, sat there in his chair, cruelly looking at those families, lips pursed, eyes narrowed as he listened to those statements. But then a guy named Bob Rule stepped up to the podium his daughter Linda had been killed by Gary Ridgway. And I'm going to put his speech, or just a little tiny piece of it, up on the screen so you can see the power of those words. He said, Mr. Ridgway, there are people here who hate you. I'm not one of them. I forgive you for what you've done. You've made it difficult to live up to what I believe, and that is what God says to do, and that is to forgive. He doesn't just say forgive just certain people. He says forgive all. So you are forgiven, sir. And an amazing thing happened when he did that. This killer who had been sitting there staring and looking cruelly back at the families, his lip started to quiver. 
His hands started to shake. And then he put his heads in his hands and began to sob. When I read this story, getting ready for this sermon, it impacted me. It convicted me about the way I feel about things. And I'm not the only one. There was a woman named Rebecca DeMauro Petty. Her 12-year-old daughter was raped and murdered by an extended family member. And when that happened, she was filled with hate and with rage. She said that when her daughter's killer was convicted and sentenced to death in the electric chair, that for a little while, about two months, things were better. But then the hate came back even worse, and she was filled with rage. But she also found that it was destroying her. It was giving her physical symptoms. It was tearing apart her relationships. She lost all joy and didn't find pleasure in anything good that happened to her. She couldn't sleep. This is a quote from Rebecca. I'd been consumed with hate for the man who murdered my daughter. My heart and soul were filled with blackness, and it nearly killed me. It almost destroyed my family, too. And as she was waiting the years for this man to be put to death, I don't think he is actually still gone uh, and been put to death yet, but she was waiting, and she watched a TV show about the Green River Killer, and she saw this powerful statement by Bob Rule. And in that moment, she was convicted. She was challenged that she needed to go back and work on forgiveness and love for even the most difficult people. Now, you may be wondering why I'm talking about serial killers on a Sunday morning. What I'm trying to do is give you an illustration that is so far over there, that's so far out there, that it covers everything in this room. So whatever's been done to you, it isn't any worse than what happened to Gary and his family. It's to illustrate Christ-like love, even in the most difficult possible circumstances. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Luke chapter 10. We're kicking off a brand new sermon series that I'm really excited about. It's called Lies We Believe, and it's these lies that we hear from Satan whispers in our ear that our community around us, our society tells us, and we begin to believe them. And if we aren't grounded in the Bible truth and we're not centered in love, we can really start to adopt those things for ourselves and to believe these lies. So here's the lie we're tackling in this sermon. I don't really have to love my enemies. This is one of the most difficult things we have to try to live out. And and let's be honest, most of us haven't experienced anything close to what Bob Rule and his family went through. But we have a hard time loving people that say bad things about us. We have a hard time loving people that treat us poorly. We have a hard time loving people that disagree with us on social media and we act strongly. It's easy to love the people that love us. It's easy to love the people that encourage us and support us, but that's not the end of our love. As followers of Jesus, our love has to be so much bigger than that. And I want to look at Jesus' words where he says the lie and then he tells us the truth. Look at this. This is Matthew 5, 43 through 44. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. There's the lie. You've heard it said. You've, You've heard it said. You've seen it on Facebook. Maybe not exactly that way, but you've seen it. But Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And and so the question is, do you really believe that? And and maybe the tougher question is, can you actually live that out? Well, today we're going through a parable that Jesus tells an expert in the law. And this expert in the law is trying to trap Jesus. He's trying to get Jesus to say something wrong under the Old Testament law so that Jesus can be arrested. And maybe even if he can't be arrested, at least it'll discredit him in front of his followers and maybe people will leave following Jesus. So, and Jesus is going to respond with a parable. Now, for those of you that may not know, a parable is a made-up story that tells an important theological or Bible truth. Another way to say that is a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so that's what Jesus is going to tell. And this is one of the most famous parables that Jesus told. If you hadn't been in church, you may still know this parable. A lot of people that aren't followers of Jesus have heard this parable. In this parable, Jesus is telling a story that everybody thinks know they know how it's going to end. They think they know the end of the story. But then towards the end, Jesus kind of changes it all around where it doesn't end the way they expect it. And the people they expected to be the protagonist or the heroes of the story aren't, and the most least likely person to be the hero becomes the hero in this story. Look at Luke 10, 25 as we set this up. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You love what he does here. He's asking a question 
that he knows the answer to. He's trying to trap Jesus, and he decides that to try to do this, because he's an expert in the law, he's going to enter into a theological debate with Jesus. Now, if you think about that, that's a really bad idea, because Jesus is, well, God. (laughs) These are his laws, right? But he doesn't know who he's dealing with, and so he you know, says, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I love Jesus' response. He, he really just so humbly comes back. Look at what Jesus does in verse 26. He says, he asks him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And just humbly says, hey, you tell me. And this guy can't help himself because he wants to show off his, his knowledge of the Old Testament law. And so in verse 27, he's going to answer. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And I love that, you know, he, he, Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will, will, you will live. You see what Jesus is doing here? He's, he's turning the tables on this guy. And he's saying, look, I'm the real teacher. Nice answer. Nice answer. And so the table, and, and this guy probably at this point, he should have quit while he was behind. But, but he doesn't. He decides he's going to try to reestablish his authority. And so look what he says next. He says uh, in verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who's my neighbor? trying to put Jesus on the spot. And so what he's doing here is he's teeing up a theological question. Who qualifies as a neighbor? In other words, who qualifies as someone that we should love and we should care about and we should take care of? And I love what Jesus does. He, he's not going to respond with a theological answer where he goes into the, the history of the word neighbor. Or he starts breaking down the word love in the Hebrew and Greek languages and kind of walks through. That's not what Jesus does. Jesus, as he so often did, tells a story. He tells a story not that's about the history of the uh, uh, Israelite people. It's a story about life. It's a simple story about how we take the law and we apply it in our lives. Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Look at at verse 30. In reply, in other words, how he answered this question, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. Now, Jesus' listeners that heard this, they knew about this road that went from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was known to be a very dangerous road where bandits patrolled and they, they would hide in the brush and attack people. So you knew you didn't go on this road by yourself. Usually they would travel in groups or even in caravans if they had stuff that was valuable that somebody might want to steal. So I'm probably thinking Jewish, his listeners are sitting there going, this, <laughs> this guy's an idiot. He should have known better than to be on that road. Some of them may have even thought, you know, he kind of he deserves what he got here. But Jesus keeps going. He says in verse 31, a priest happened to go down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So you have a, a Jewish priest, a very important person, who walks, walks by this Jewish man and keeps going. Now, this Jewish priest was a very important person. I'm sure he was probably running late to teach in the synagogue or in the temple. And so he's in, in, in a hurry. But there's some other reasons why he probably didn't stop. The first one is it's dangerous. Sometimes these robbers would hurt somebody, lay them on the side of the road, and when another person came along and stopped to help, they'd jump that person too and take their stuff. But there were some other reasons. A Jewish priest couldn't touch a dead body. And if they touched a dead body, they became ceremonially unclean, and they had to go through a a ritual cleansing process that was a lot of work. Even if he found the man still alive, but he was taking care of the man and he died while he was taking care of him, he'd have this same problem, that he would have touched a dead body. And look, he was wearing an expensive robe, I'm sure. If he helped the man, he might get blood all over it and have to buy him some new clothes. You know, it's probably better if he doesn't get involved. Surely someone else will come along. And someone does. Look at verse 32. So too a Levite man, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So you got another temple official. This is a Levite who's in charge of a lot of the administrative responsibilities in the temple and would also help the priests with more routine teaching. And, and look, I'm sure this guy was headed to a mission team meeting. He had somewhere he had to be. And so he's, you know, constantly checking his Apple watch as he's walking on that road. And he, you know, who knows, maybe when he gets to this meeting to talk about mission activities, he might even mention this guy that he passed and say, look, there are some people that are hurt on that road to Jericho. We we probably could do something. Maybe we could start a ministry for taking care of hurt people along that road to Jericho. We could call it like Jericho's Heroes, and we could make a huge impact on people. And so he passes on by. 
let's be honest, it, it kind of seems a little hard to imagine that not one, but two different religious leaders would pass by this person so desperately in need and just keep going. Maybe Jesus wasn't really being fair in this story. Maybe he was overemphasizing. As a preacher, I, I wish that were true, but this Good Samaritan theory has actually been tested. Back in 1973, two psychology professors at Princeton University, they decided to conduct a little experiment there on some, on some pastors in training. And so at the Princeton Theological Seminary, they set this test up. So here's how the tests work. They gave the seminary students an assignment to write a sermon quickly. They said, you know, times you're going to have to write sermons at the last minute, preach a funeral, whatever it might be. So you need to do that. So part of your grade is how quickly you can write a good sermon. They gave half the group a sermon topic that was the role of a minister. The other half, they assigned a sermon of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so as these students start to write as quickly as they can, get their sermon in place, a teaching assistant runs into the room and says, we have to have this room for a different function and you guys have got to leave. So you, you got to go to finish, you got to go across campus and we've got another room set up for you over there, but you need to go fast. You need to walk fast because this, the timer is going. We're not stopping that. But we got a map for you that tells you the fastest way to walk from here to there. And so all the students, they take uh, that little map and they start headed out as fast as they can to go finish their assignment. And here's where the test com comes in. They had staged an actor in a doorway just a few feet from the uh, sidewalk who was slumped over looking near dead. And as, the, as these students walked by, the person would moan loudly and cough and look like he was physically in significant pain. They wanted to test to see if these seminary students would risk getting a bad grade to stop and help someone in need. Almost none of them did. And they thought maybe the students that were actually writing a sermon on the parable of the Good Samaritan would do a little better job, but they didn't. It was about the same. So after a few went by without stopping, they thought, well, maybe people can't really see or see well enough. So they moved the actor onto the sidewalk where they were walking. And so he's, you know, moaning and, and laying over on the sidewalk. And, and they said that some of the seminary students actually stepped over this man to keep running to where they were going to finish their sermon. They were, they were so focused on getting a sermon together on helping people that they didn't have time to stop and help. Several years ago at a different church, I kind of had my own uh, Good Samaritan test, and it wasn't a made-up thing. It was a real situation. Uh, it was a bigger church, and I was the executive and teaching pastor, and so I had a lot of responsibilities. I'm really good about usually writing sermons way in advance and being good about you know, getting that done, but this week, because there was so much going on, I, I was way behind. And I actually had a sign that my administrative assistant would put up on my door in those moments that said, don't come in here unless there's an emergency. And that sign was on the door that day. And I'm desperately writing. And there's a soft knock at my door. And, and, and an admin pokes her head in. And she says, so, okay, a guy came in the front door. And he's crying. Says his wife just left him. He doesn't have anywhere to turn because he doesn't uh, have a church, he, you know, that he goes to. And he just wants to talk to a pastor. And I'm like, well, there's got to be more pastors here today. They said, there aren't. You're it. And I, and I just remember being fresh. I've, I've got important stuff that, that I have to do. I've got to finish this sermon. Surely there's somebody else that can help. And, and I almost had the admin go back downstairs and set up a meeting for next week between him and me. But after I was frustrated for a couple of moments, I said, I'll do it. And so I went down with not really a good attitude about my situation. And I saw this man just tears just pouring off his face. And he told me that his wife, he'd married a younger uh, wife that... He just doted on that he poured everything into, and she decided she wasn't ready to be married. And so she just left him and said, I want a divorce because I don't want to be married. And he was devastated. He told me he didn't have family in town and that, that he hadn't gone to church since he was a little boy. We talked for quite a while. We prayed together. And I invited him to church on Sunday because I was preaching. And sure enough, he came to church on Sunday, and he kept coming for the next few weeks. And we kept talking and praying together. And a few weeks later, he decided to follow Jesus, and I had the privilege of baptizing him. Three years later, I performed the wedding of him and his new wife as his life began to turn around. That was 10 years ago. His new wife and him now have two kids uh, that they love. And I almost missed an opportunity to be a part of this beautiful life change story because I was too busy with what I thought was important. You know what the sermon that I was writing at the time that this happened? Parable of the Good Samaritan. And I almost became the priest 
or the Levite in this story. Too busy with church to help someone in need. See, we, we can't afford to allow our busyness to keep us from loving people the way Jesus tells us to. We, we run out of church on Sundays and we gotta, we gotta get home. We got yard work to do, we got a football game to see, we gotta get the kids ready, we gotta get ready for work on Monday. And then during the week, we, we run from work to school activities to homework and all the different things. We just feel like, you know, we just don't have time to really, really take care of people in need. But are we as busy as we think we are? How much time do you spend flipping through social media or watching some TV or internet shows or playing video games or surfing the internet? I think sometimes it's less of a time problem and more of a priority problem. It's just not important enough that we take that time. But see, busyness isn't an excuse for not helping others. All right, look at verse 33. It says, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. I- I'm sure these Jewish listeners, when they heard Jesus telling this story, and they heard that a priest passed by, and then a Levite, they were probably thinking, man, who is going to be the hero of the story? It's going to probably be a, J- a Jewish teacher we've heard about. We know. We, know. we want him to come to town. We can't wait till he gets there. But surely, at least, it'll be a Jewish man that's very serious about the Old Testament law. But that's not what Jesus does. This is where the story takes a big twist in turn, because he picked a Samaritan man to be the hero of this story. And he was the most unlikely of people to stop and help because Samaritans and Jewish people, they hated one another. They they didn't like each other at all. This change in the story would have been scandalous because Jesus suddenly took and injected race into this issue, suddenly injected some different religious thoughts into this issue. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about why Jewish people and Samaritans didn't like one another, but I'll tell you a couple of the big things that caused the Jewish people to not like them. So Samaritans were originally full-blooded Jewish people, but they had become more connected with some of the the tribes around, some of the pagan groups, and they'd intermarried, so they were no longer purely Jewish by by birth. And this was very frustrating to to the Jewish people. They also worshiped the, the Jewish, the one true God of Israel, but they'd injected some idolatry in it because they were intermarried with these pagan people and they lived amongst them. They'd kind of adopted some of the, the idol practices, so they'd kind of woven some of that idolatry into their worship of the one true God. And the Jewish people didn't like that either. It was so bad, this, this dislike and hate was so bad that some Jewish rabbis taught that Jewish people weren't allowed to help a Samaritan woman in labor. Because the theory was, if she was successful in her labor, you just have one more Samaritan person you had to deal with. That's just to give you the perspective on how they felt about one another. And and the hate went both ways. There was lots of fear and mistrust between these groups. And and so a Samaritan man was the least likely to stop and help. And in fact, a Samaritan man might be thought of to think, maybe laugh and point at the guy at his misfortune. Or maybe even make fun at him as he walks by. Maybe even go and kick him while he's hurting and down. That's the story. And it took a twist. It took a turn. Look, it says that this Samaritan man had pity on Jesus. And I I actually don't love the NIV's translation of the original Greek word used here into pity because now pity kind of has a little bit of a negative connotation for us. If you translate that word literally, it means great compassion. And it's the same word that would often be used when Jesus saw somebody that needed to be healed and it said he had great compassion on them. And so this Samaritan man, he sees this Jewish man that's hurting and he has great compassion and he does something about it. You see what Jesus is doing in this story? He he changes it all up because if he'd have used the the Jewish priest or the Levite as the hero of the story, we'd have gone, yeah, that makes sense. Of course they would. I mean, that's kind of their job. But he he flips it upside down and he tells it a different way so that suddenly he injects race and nationality into the story. He he wants us to understand that despite our differences in opinion, despite our differences about how politics should go, how religion and social issues should go, we love one another. We love people that don't even love us. And, And so he wants us to understand who our neighbor is. Our neighbor is our family members. It's the people on our street. It's the friends that we care a lot about. But it's also the homeless guy that we drive by every day on our way to work and don't even know who he is. 
It's also the person that's standing out in front of a broken down car that you've never met before that you can tell is struggling in the Texas heat. It's the coworker who goes out of their way to make you look bad in front of the boss. It's that person that always disagrees with you on social media and says things that aren't true and aren't right. Our neighbor is someone of another race who doesn't think about things the way we do or takes a different position in politics that you don't like or you agree with. Your neighbor is anyone who's in need, even your enemy. So look at verses 34 through 37. It says, this Samaritan man, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, which is money, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. And then Jesus looks at this teacher of the law, this expert in the law, he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. I love what the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. said about the different characters in this story. He, he said first about the, the priest and the Levite, he said, it's possible these religious men were afraid. The first question that the priest and Levite probably asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? Man, when we see somebody in need, do we first think about how's that going to impact me? How's that going to affect my time? It may cost me some money if I have to help out. It may put me at a little risk or a little danger. Or do we think more about what would happen if we don't get involved? What would happen to that person? The English word parable here comes from the Greek word called parabole. And what parabole means is to cast two things up against one another for teaching or comparison. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing in this story. He's casting the religious leaders up against the Samaritan man who was the least likely to want to help because he was an enemy of the Jewish man. And he's saying, comparing the two. But he's not just doing that. He's asking this expert in the law to compare himself to those two different groups and decide, are you more like the religious leaders that pass on by? Or are you more like the Samaritan man that helps even the people that he doesn't like very much? And it's also asking us to make that comparison. Who do, we, who do we identify more? Do you think more like the Jewish priest and the Levite? Or do you think more about how you can make a difference in the people around you? You know, for whatever reason, Luke, who tells this story, he doesn't tell us the end of the story. He doesn't tell us what the impact of this parable that Jesus told on this expert in the law. It didn't tell us if maybe he had now had the truth that we're not to hate our enemies, we're to love our enemies. Did it change him in some way? Did his idea of neighbor change? Did he follow Jesus? He didn't tell us anything. I love to think that he was changed by the truth of what Jesus told him, but I doubt that he was. He may have thought, good story, but as he kept going by and life took over again and he got busy, he probably went right back to doing things just the way he had done before. And I think there's a real tendency for us to do the same thing. We, we may get kind of convicted in a sermon like this. We may say amen, feel really good about it. But then we go out of those doors, back to our busy lives and our jobs and our kids, and nothing really changes. And, and look, it's not that we don't understand the message. It's not that we even disagree with it. I mean, theoretically, of course. But if we're really honest with ourselves, it's just that we don't really care enough to do anything different. And that's just the honest truth person in need, that is just not that big a priority. We probably couldn't make a difference anyway. I've heard it said that the opposite of love isn't hate. The opposite of love is indifference. Can, can I let you in on a little secret? A big part of the reason you're sitting here in Katy, Texas, worshiping Jesus, that the word of the gospel and good news of Jesus had traveled halfway around the world is because the early church loved their enemies. It's that simple. The early church was first persecuted by the Jewish leadership. But then the Roman Empire got involved, and when they got involved, it was way worse. They set them on fire. They fed them to wild animals. They beheaded them in public. They put them on crosses and crucified them upside down like one of the apostles were. It's fair to say that the Roman Empire were enemies of the Christians. But the Christians fought hate with love. And it made people wonder what... What would make somebody love somebody that hates them? What would make them love in that way? This kind of love was scandalous. It was countercultural. 
but it was also world-changing. Eventually, this kind of love for an enemy, it defeated the Roman Empire. In 380 AD, the Emperor Constantine made, uh, I'm sorry, in 313, the Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity. Just 60 years later, same generation, Christianity became the official religion of Rome. And it spread throughout the entire world, and it's changed our lives here in Katy, Texas. Because of this crazy love that's just unexpected, that isn't deserved, love for enemies changed the world, and we've heard about Jesus here in Katy, Texas. Author Frederick Buechner was trying to describe what this kind of crazy love looks like and the way that Christ loved us, and here's what he wrote in his book. The love for equals is a human thing, a friend for friend, brother for brother. It is to love what's loving and lovely, and the world smiles. The love for the less fortunate is a beautiful thing. The love for those who suffer, for those who are poor, the sick, the failures, the unlovely. This is compassion and it touches the heart of the world. The love for the more fortunate is a rare thing. To love those who succeed where we fail. To rejoice without envy with those who rejoice. The love of the poor for the rich. The world's always bewildered by its saints. And then there's the love for the enemy. Love for the one who doesn't love you, who mocks threatens and inflicts pain. The tortured's love for the torturer. This is God's love. This is the love that changes the world. That's how we're loved by Jesus. And then we're told to have that same kind of love. Look, you want to know why the church is getting its teeth kicked in right now in American culture? Why people are leaving the church in droves? I think it's easy to write it off and say, well, yeah, America is less moral than it once was. That's true. America is less moral and deteriorated than it once was. But we can't stick with the Roman Empire. Those dudes did stuff at parties that we read about in books. Way more immoral, way more messed up than us. And Christianity spread like wildfire through that group of people. It's also easy to say, well, yeah, it's because you know the, the, we're being persecuted by the culture around us. The government is taking our rights away, making it harder for us to reach people. There's some truth to that. We are becoming the butt of more jokes. We are being pushed on by culture. We are having some rights taken away, but we can't stick with the Roman Empire. Those people were fed to bears and lions for funsies. They literally took Christians and lit them on fire at parties to serve as human lights. They were beaten and jailed and crucified for teaching and preaching about Jesus. And it spread throughout the entire Roman world. All of those things were true there, way more than it is here. Church grew exponentially. Do you know where one of the places the church is growing the fastest right now? Iran. (laughs) Iran is not a safe place to be a Christian. It's a very dangerous place to be a Christian. Here's why the the church is becoming less relevant in American culture. We don't love our enemies. We don't love like Jesus loved. See, we come to church to feel good about ourselves, and then we go back to our busy lives, and we just kind of treat everybody the the same way that everybody else does. And and then we wonder why people aren't excited about all the rules we talk about. It's because they don't see the love. The early church, they cared for one another in a way that was world-changing. Then they loved even their enemies in a way that made people want to be a part of what was going on. And, And I can be honest when I say I'm not sure the average Christian today treats people they don't know really much better and non-Christians for the most part, we bought into the lie that we don't really have to love our enemies. Social media is a microcosm of this problem. On social media, I see Christians being hateful to people that disagree with them about religion or politics or social issues. And I look at that and I'm like, just don't post your picture from church on Sunday, just don't do it. And it gets so much worse (laughs) in the next few months we're about to go through. You've seen it, the presidential election politics. Hateful stuff by Christians. I also see posts and memes by Christians and people that go to church that literally spread this lie that I don't really have to love my enemies. Now, they don't come out and say it that way, but here's a post you might see from a Christian. Get rid of the people who don't treat you the way you deserve to be treated. I've missed that in the Bible. I've been through it a few times, and I've never seen that particular verse Or or maybe it's said this way, surround yourself with only the people who encourage you and improve your life. I don't remember that verse in the Bible either. I don't remember Jesus ever saying that. Here's the problem. If we disassociate from everybody that we don't like, 
We disassociate from the people who disagree with us. We unfriend the people who don't like our posts or say something negative about our opinions on Facebook. We don't have the ability to impact them. It is that Christ-like love. It is the love for an enemy that changed the world 2,000 years ago. And it will be that kind of love for enemies that changes the world again today. Our mission statement here at Kara City is to show intentional grace to others, one person at a time. And when we show that to each other, and we should, we're called to do that, that's all right. But man, when we do that for the people that don't like us or that we don't get along with, it's going to transform the world again. Christians should be known as the most generous, helpful, loving people out there. And if we can do that, if we can love our enemies and we can love like that early church, it's going to change the world. We're going to be blown away by what God does in us and through us here at Karis City and how we impact the community around us. Because they're going to want to hear a lot more about our rules when they experience our love. But so many of us, we're like the priest and the Levite. It's just so much easier. It's so much less risky to just kind of distance ourselves from the problem. Pass by on the other side of the road. At the beginning of this sermon, I talked about the trial of the Green River Killer. And I told you about some of these families that said very hateful things to a person who, from a worldly perspective, deserved all of those things. And then, but Bob Rule made an impact by what he said. And, and so many people have been impacted by this statement. But I want, I want you to see just this is a little short clip. It's just little touches of what a couple of families said first, and then a little piece of what Bob Rule said. Check out this powerful video. He's an animal. I wish for him to have a long, suffering, cruel death. He's going to go to hell, and that's where he belongs. Mr. Ridgway. Um, there are people here that hate you. Andy. I, I'm not one of them. You have, you've made it difficult it's quite to weird. live up to what I believe, and that is what God says to do, and that's to forgive. You are forgiven, sir. Thank you, sir. The impact was when we love in a way that's unexpected, that's scandalous, that's countercultural, that doesn't even seem right. That's the love that changed the world 2,000 years ago. That's the love that will transform us and the people around us. And so let me ask you, what kind of church do we want to be? Do we want to be a church that just kind of gets together on Sunday mornings and, you know, and just, man, we, we did Jesus so right this week. We showed up for an hour and we sang some songs and listened to a little teaching. Or do we want to be a church that shows that kind of love and then see what Jesus does in us and through us when we love in such an unexpected way? So as we wrap up, I want to ask you to ask yourself this question. Do I go through life surrounded by neighbors or do I go through life surrounded by people I don't even really know as I pass by on the other side of the road? Let's pray.